Pharmacogenomics is really a growing and expanding field within the world of, of pharmacy practice. Uh, I want to give you a lot of examples that you certainly might be tested on it at some point um, with good uh, clinical background as well in, in how, you know, whether you're a rapid metabolizer, so, slow metabolizer, how that might clinically impact our patients. So I'll give you some really uh, common examples of how pharmacogenomics uh, can impact our, our patients here. So first, a couple of, you know, background things, definition things. Uh, when I break down pharmacogenomics, I think of two uh, basic overlying principles. And so one is safety. So if we've got a patient that um, is at risk for an adverse effect due to a genetic alteration, um, that is certainly an issue that we're going to look out for that's going to be important to us. Uh, another thing, uh, uh, if a patient maybe runs the risk of higher concentrations uh, due to a genetic variation, again, we can ha you know, get closer to toxicity and, and adverse effects. Again, another safety concern there. And then, of course, we've got efficacy. So if we've got a rapid metabolizer of a drug, we're not going to get... Uh, therapeutic concentrations or at least have less likely of a potential to get to, to therapeutic concentrations and we may be more likely to fail off of that drug or we might not have success with that drug. Uh, so think about those two principles when we're thinking about pharmacogenomics. Um, if you get confused or, or you know in all the details and, and different uh, genetic variations, I definitely come back to those principles and think about how that genetic variation um, might impact safety or, or efficacy. Now, CPIC is a really uh, cool resource that I've uh, stumbled into, come across when I uh, review information on, on pharmacogenetics or pharmacogenomics. Uh, that's Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium is what the name is there. Um, again, they've got some, some guidelines, some resources, uh, some really good info uh, there about the uh, clinical practice, clinical application. Uh, concepts, really, really basic, basic concepts you got to know is uh, rapid metabolizer versus a slow or a poor metabolizer. And in the um, clinical context of a specific drug, if we've got a patient who is a rapid metabolizer of a drug, they're going to naturally have lower concentrations of that drug. If they're a slow metabolizer or a poor metabolizer, uh, this is going likely going to result in potentially higher concentrations at a given dose. Now, prodrugs are opposite. Remember that prodrugs are uh, drugs that are essentially activated by the body or turned into the active compound by enzymes within the body. So, for instance, we need those enzymes to convert that drug to the active drug that's going to have action in the body. And if we slow those enzymes down, that might result in lower concentrations of the active drug. If we speed those enzymes up, that could result in quicker conversion to the active drug and may facilitate the risk of uh, toxicity, whatever toxicity that, that drug has in, in its profile. So basic, basic concepts you, you just got to remember and got to understand for sure. So let's get into those examples. I told you I was going to give you a bunch. Uh, by far, I would say the most uh, common example I've seen in clinical practice, I would say the one that we have a, a, a good deal of evidence with is clopidogrel. And clopidogrel is one of those quirky ones where it is a prodrug. And with a type of variation uh, with CYP2C19, patients uh, can, because of that alteration, uh, increase the risk of reduced clinical effects if they are a poor metabolizer at that enzyme. So again, clopidogrel gets converted to the active compound uh, that has the clinical activity. It does this via CYP2C19. If CYP2C19 doesn't work as well as it should, uh, 
we're going to end up with lower concentrations. And for example, we might run an increased risk of a heart attack, which clopidogrel is supposed to be helping us, us treat there. So in the event uh, that we do have you know, treatment failure and or maybe we recognize uh, that the patient has uh, a variant in this gene that doesn't allow them uh, to adequately convert clopidogrel to its active form, uh, we might consider um, a, a, an antiplatelet agent that doesn't go through uh, that mechanism. And a good example there would be like prasigrel. Other examples here, uh, and I'll, I'll, I do have a couple of slides later on with a bunch of CYP2D6 drugs. I think that's a really, really important one uh, to remember, especially when it comes to, to pain meds and psych meds. Very, very important. Uh, but the example listed here, so we've got codeine. Again, this is another example of a prodrug. Um, by CYP2D6, codeine gets converted to morphine. And I do remember reading a case one time where somebody ended up uh, with uh, opioid toxicity, and one of the reasons, rationales, was a drug interaction with CYP2D6, and they also um, thought that that patient, or found out that that patient was a uh, rapid metabolizer at CYP2D6, which would lead to greater concentrations of, of morphine and a greater clinical effect, which in the case of that patient led to uh, toxicity and, and opioid uh, type uh, overdose symptoms. So again, rapid metabolizer, that's going to increase risk of opioid overdose. Again, it's pro-drug. Slow metabolizer uh, is going to increase the risk that a patient doesn't respond or doesn't get any uh, relief from that codeine. Warfarin, uh, 2C, CYP2C9. So there we're not talking pro-drugs. Um, here we're talking the actual compound itself. So at 2C9, if you've got a rapid metabolizer, we're then going to likely need higher dosages uh, to get to that goal INR, whatever we're shooting for there. Poor metabolizer, we're likely going to run into higher INRs if we're not paying attention to our dose. Or if you give the standard dose to uh, one patient that is a rapid metabolizer and a standard dose, let's say five milligrams, to a poor metabolizer, then you're you know, likely going to get pretty variable INRs where the rapid metabolizer may have a lower INR, poor metabolizer um, would likely have a higher INR. Now this gets tricky with clinical situations because you might have a patient that's on uh, other drugs that interact with these enzymes as well. And that can, that's what, you know, in my mind, that's one of the really hard things about pharmacogenomics is that clinical interpretation of um, using the information that we might get from pharmacogenomics, uh, but also recognizing that there are other factors that could certainly uh, alter concentrations as well. Some other genetic uh, variations that you, you definitely see come up uh, in the literature, uh, allopurinol. Uh, so be, due to this genetic variation, HLA-B5801, so if a patient's positive for that, uh, there is increased risk for a skin uh, type reaction, uh, rash, things of, of that nature. So definitely a, a good one to remember there. Uh, carbamazepine, so that's HLA-B1502. So if a patient's positive for that, we've got an increased risk of uh, Steven Johnson syndromes. Uh, Urinotecan, chemotherapy type agent, uh, there we've got a UGT1A1 gene alteration. And if a patient has that alteration, uh, we run the risk of uh, neutropenia, or that patient's at higher risk for neutropenia from that agent. Uh, Tacrolimus, uh, you know, agent immunosuppressive type agent, uh, that's CYP3A5. Uh, this is obviously a really sensitive and really, really important drug to keep uh, even concentrations of. Uh, so if you've got an extensive metabolizer at 3A5, you're likely going to have to push that dose higher and, and quicker uh, to make sure we get uh, that patient to a goal therapeutic uh, concentration. But that might explain uh, in a patient where we've had to continually escalate the doses um, that, yeah, maybe they are an extensive metabolizer there. So good, 
uh, genetic variation to remember on uh, tacrolimus there. Uh, six mercaptopurine, not used uh, terribly often, uh, but TPMT gene variation. Uh, so this carries an increased risk for uh, myelosuppression. Um, Toprolol, very commonly used agent in uh, blood pressure management, atrial fibrillation, uh, heart failure, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, remember that this one uh, does uh, is pretty extensively metabolized by CYP uh, 2D6. So genetic variations there with 2D6 could lead to higher or lower concentrations depending upon you know rapid or, or a slow metabolizer there. Uh, phenytoin 2C9. Uh, very, very important to, to recognize that. Also, tons of drug interactions with phenytoin as well. Uh, so that can be really a, a complicated uh, drug to uh, kind of manage and, and pay attention to. Uh, abacavir, there's actually a requirement, a uh, recommendation that all patients should be screened um, in patients that are, are using this medication for, uh, let's say, management of, of their HIV. Uh, they should be screened for HLA-B5701. And if they uh, are positive for this, they are at risk for a hypersensitivity reaction and other medication um, should potentially be looked at. And avoidance of abacavir uh, would be important there. Uh, simvastatin, there is a variation there. Uh, I'm seeing less and less simvastatin being used simply because we really can't get to as uh, potent as of a dose as we can with, let's say, a torvastatin or a suvastatin. Now, rasburicase, uh, that can be used to, to bring down uric acid, specifically uh, in, in malignancy. So with patients with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, uh, there is a risk of, of hemolysis there. So important to, to remember that. And actually, we've got... Um, patients of certain descent uh, are at higher risk uh, for this uh, genetic alteration. So African and, and Mediterranean populations uh, may be at a little bit higher risk there. So I did mention that, that I had a list of uh, drugs affected by CYP 2D6. I think it's very, very important to, to recognize this. Um, and if you see a, a patient with uh, CYP2D6 variation, whether they're a rapid metabolizer, um, and the likelihood of them responding to some of these drugs might be lower, or a, you know, poor metabolizer, uh, those patients may be at greater risk for toxicity for some of these, especially if they, they aren't pro-drugs, obviously, then it'd be the opposite. Um, but good good list here to, to kind of remember, and I, and I remember a lot of the psych drugs, uh, paroxetine, fluoxetine, sertraline, uh, bupropion, venlafaxine, uh, those can all have uh, CYP2D6 impacts. And on the pharmacogenomic side, yes, very, very important, obviously. Uh, on the um, drug interaction side of things, this can also be very important as well, where a CYP2D6 inhibitor can increase the concentrations of, of some of these drugs for sure. So, uh, very, very important to, to I think, remember uh, some of these and, and the impacts of, of CYP2D6. So these are all generally psych drugs. And then we definitely do have some other drugs. I, I mentioned the um, codeine uh, prior there uh, in, in an earlier slide. Uh, one I have definitely come across in, in practice is you will see a, a significant or some patients on tamoxifen uh, for long-term a management, prevention, recurrence of, of breast cancer. And let's say you have a uh, slow metabolizer, well, they might not benefit from that tamoxifen as well as somebody who's, you know, a normal uh, metabolizer by CYP2D6. Same thing with, with drug interactions. I mentioned a lot of those psych drugs on the previous slide there. So you put somebody on fluoxetine, for example, it's a CYP2D6 inhibitor, so that's going to inhibit the action of that enzyme. You're not going to get as much of the active uh, prodrug, uh, the active metabolite of that tamoxifen, if you're on some of these uh, drugs that interact. Well, 
that certainly is a big risk and a big, big concern if a patient's at higher risk of breast cancer uh, because they're not getting adequate concentrations of the drug uh, that the oncologist or whoever is uh, prescribing that medication. So uh, very, very important uh, thing to remember there. Uh, tramadol is another another pro-drug or where the, the most active uh, component is uh, converted there by CYP2D6. Uh, propranolol, totaridine, uh, quinine, I can't say I see that used too often. Oxycodone, uh, another good example there where, you know, maybe we run the risk of toxicity or of non-response based upon uh, genetic alterations in how active that uh, CYP2D6 uh, enzyme is there. So as you can see, there's definitely a, a lot of drugs, and, and this isn't you know a 100% entire list, but these are a lot of the drugs that we know a lot of information about and how they uh, can be affected um, by genetic variations in how these drugs are uh, metabolized and or converted uh, to their, their active form.